Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala rahmatin lil alamin Wa mantab yadinahu bil ihsan ila yawmitin Indeed our praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And we ask Allah to send his peace and blessings Upon the mercy to this universe The final messenger Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And to all those who follow his way with righteousness Until the last day the topic I have chosen for discussing in this session is the issue of child education in Islam, its importance and how we can go about in doing it. If you look at the Ummah today, many of the children and the young Muslims are running away from Islam and they do not want to attend the Islamic schools. They do not want to attend Islamic lectures and workshops. They do not want to go to the madrasa and the Islamic uh, institutes. And this should raise a question in our head as to why. Why don't the children want to study Islam? What I have found is that many of these children, they want to study Islam. They want to. But our approach to teaching many a times is wrong. Too often, our approach to teaching children is one of rigidity and harshness and always condemning them and declaring things to be haram. And it's also one of blind following where the students are not allowed to ask questions, they are not allowed to express their views and their doubts and all of this will chase a youngster away. And so if we want to attract children back to our Islamic institutes, we need to change our methodology of presenting Islam to them. Now, if your content is authentic, there is no need to change the content. But the way that content is presented, the type of teacher that presents it, this might need to be changed if the, if the presentation is chasing the youngsters away from Islam. This is a very important topic because if we want to see a global Islamic revival of the correct understanding of Islam, then we need to reach out to the younger generation and we need to educate our children and raise them upon Tawheed, to raise them upon Quran and Sunnah, to raise them upon the correct understanding of Islam. If we don't do this, then we will see another lost generation. How do we do this? Well, there are two types of people who will play a very important role in this education. The first is the parent and the second is the teacher. And I say the first is the parent because the first mistake that many parents make is that they leave their children's Islamic education to the teachers. And they feel they don't need to play any role. Rather, the parents play the primary role in shaping the children's Islamic understanding. Because the child spends his first five or six years of his life completely in the company of his parents. They watch every move that the parent makes. They follow everything that the parents do. Their method of speech is that of the parents. And so if the parents are not practicing Muslims, they should not expect their children to be so as well. Even after that, when the child starts school, if you put him in an Islamic environment, in an Islamic school, but the whole environment is not Islamic, what will happen? That child will go to school and see something, he will come home and see the opposite, he will, number one, lose respect for his parents, number two, he will become confused, and many a times, 
he will decide not to practice Islam. And so the parents play the primary role in shaping their children's understanding of Islam. After the parents comes the teachers. And it is very important to choose the teachers of your children carefully. You should find people in your community who are not just knowledgeable about the deen, but number one, they should be practicing Muslims, their knowledge should be authentic, should be number two, and number three, they should be able to connect with the young Muslims. There should be such people who, when the youngsters see them, they want to be like them. Their hearts connect. They look up to such people. These are the individuals who you should send your children to to study Islam. And this is the way of the early generations. That parents would send their children to the scholars who their children looked up to as they knew this would have the biggest impact on the child's understanding and, and practice of Islam. If we look at the early generation of parents, Imam Malik Rahimahullah, before he was Imam Malik, he was a little boy by the name of Malik Ibn Anas. And his mother and father were both from a scholarly background. And they wanted their children to become scholars. So Imam Malik's elder brother used to spend a lot of time studying Islam. But Imam Malik, he was, as a youngster, as a child, more interested in songs, in singing, and in playing with pigeons. And his parents were very worried about him. So what did his parents do? Did they say, no, he's a child. Let him do as he pleases. When he grows older, maybe we'll talk to him about being a good Muslim. No, they did not. His father called him and his brother together and gave them a little quiz about Islam. And his brother was able to answer questions more than he was. So all his father told him was, the pigeons have distracted you. That's all he told him. He wasn't harsh to him. He wasn't mean to him. He just told him the pigeons have distracted you. But this hit Imam Malik's heart. And it made him realize that he is wasting time and he needs to spend more time studying Islam. He was a child at this time. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't even a teenager yet. He was still a child. He then, in another narration, he mentioned he told his mother that I want to be a singer. His mother, in order to discourage him from becoming a singer, told him that you don't have the looks to be a singer. Now, Imam Malik was a very handsome man, but his mother told him this to discourage him from becoming a singer. So now, the singing aspect was discouraged, and the aspect of playing all the time was discouraged. Imam Malik now himself made up his mind to study Islam. Look at the methodology of his parents. They weren't harsh. They never forced him to study Islam. They never beat him. They never condemned him. But with wisdom, they tried to indicate to him that they wanted him to study Islam. And so Imam Malik, rahimullah, began his study of Islam. And when he began his study of Islam, it was his parents who chose his primary teachers. It was his mother who chose his teachers. And his mother told him to go to certain teachers. And he told, and she told him to study their character before he studies their fiqh. And so she would dress him up and tie his turban for him as a young boy, as a child, and send him up to the circles of knowledge to study Islam. And it was because of parents like that, that this youngster became Imam Malik, rahimahullah. That's the kind of parent we need today. That's the kind of parent that will create and shape a new generation of Islamic scholarship. Imam Malik was not the only one to have such a mother. Imam Ash-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he was often at a young age. His father passed away when he was a child. And he was living in Gaza. But his mother, now a single mother, took him to Makkah. And she moved from Gaza to Makkah for what reason? So her son can study Islam. And when they reached Makkah, they did not have enough money to pay the Islamic teachers. But she wanted her son to study Islam. So they made a deal with the teacher that Imam Shafi would serve the teacher and do some of the work for him in exchange for him teaching, Imam, for teaching 
Imam ash shafi Obviously at this time he was not known as Imam ash shafi He was a child by the name of Muhammad. So this young child Muhammad, he showed great intellect. And he memorized the Quran in a very short period of time. And he even memorized the Muwatta of, of Imam Malik by the age of nine. And his teachers recognized his potential and his mother recognized his potential. And now he said that he wants to move to Medina to study under Imam Malik. He's still a child. But because of the training his mother had given him and the environment he, she had put him in, he now was looking for the best of teachers so he can study Islam. And so they moved to Medina and he began studying under Imam Malik while he was still a child. And he became Imam Ash-Shafi'i Rahimahullah. Two people played a very important role in that. Number one was his mother and the good parenting that she had given him. Number two was the teachers that were chosen for him. The teacher that his mother chose in Makkah and the teacher that he chose for himself, Imam Malik. So for the younger generation to gain a correct understanding of Islam, it is very important that their parents play a primary role and that their teachers are people of high upstanding character and also that they are people who have the correct knowledge and who the children can look up to and want to be like. Likewise, Imam al-Bukhari, his mother played a very important role in his life. Imam al-Bukhari, at one point in time as a child, he was blinded. He could not see any longer. But his mother would cry at night and make dua for him. Until Allah had granted him a miracle. In a dream, she had seen that his, his eyesight was restored. And when she woke up, and when he woke up, indeed, Imam al-Bukhari as a child, his eyesight was restored. Not just restored, but restored to such a level that even at night he did not need lights. He could read under the moonlight. This was the type of eyesight Allah had given him. This was a miracle from Allah, given to him because of a righteous mother. A righteous mother who was concerned about her son. So the parents out there, if you want your child to be a good Muslim, you need to be their role model. You need to be a good Muslim. You need to make dua for them because the dua of parents is always accepted. You need to mold them and shape them in the right direction. Without being harsh, without being mean, without being judgmental, but to show them the right way like how Imam Ali experienced it and to guide them onto the correct way of studying Islam. And then we come to the teachers. Nowadays there are many Muslim schools who do not have a syllabus uh, in terms of goals. They may have a syllabus of study for grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, but there's no goal at the end of the day of where they want the children to reach. What must this knowledge take them towards? In many of these schools, Islamic studies is being taught just as a subject, like every other subject. And so the students study it to pass the examination. And when the examination is over, they have forgotten what they have studied. Because the higher purpose is not there. Those of you who are running schools, or who are teaching in schools, or who are in charge of the curriculum of schools, you need to work out your goals. What do we want to accomplish with the children who are being sent to our school? What level of Islam and Iman do we want them to have at the end of the road? And accordingly, you need to set your syllabus. If you want students who have the correct Aqidah, then the correct Aqidah must be taught in the syllabus. If you want students who have correct Akhlaq and character, then the teachers need to have good character at all times. And the students need to be taught this in a structured manner because many schools always tell the students have good akhlaq, have good character, have adab but how and the methodology is not taught and many times it is not even shown by the teachers themselves I have been to schools where even the Islamic studies teachers had such character that they used words I cannot say here on video and the Islamic studies teachers would sit outside with the students and smoke cigarettes. 
and they would use vulgar language and the students of that school were not much better and when you would try speaking to the students to become good Muslims what would they say? but our Sheikh, our Mulana also does this so to those of you who are teachers in Islamic schools realize your responsibility you are the role model to these students if you are smoking cigarettes which is completely prohibited if you study the evidences I know some people say it is makru but the evidences indicate that it is prohibited even if it was makru an Islamic studies teacher should not do so because you represent the deen so you need to realize your responsibility as a teacher of Islam people watch our every move they learn more from what we do than from what we say and we need to be role models to our students we need to be careful what we speak to them about the type of language that we use and the type of things we do with them because we are representing the deen and we want them to, sh to see a clean and clear concept of the deen so that when they look at us they want to be good Muslims many youngsters have said that the thing that chased them away from Islam is that the Islamic studies teachers were not role models the teacher will teach them one thing in school and practice something else and the student will look at this as hypocrisy and they will say that if my teacher is like this you know, what kind of a religion is this? what hope do I have of being a good Muslim? so teachers primarily need to become the role models just like parents the teachers need to become the role models so whatever position you have in an Islamic school don't take it lightly increase your knowledge of the deen increase your practice of the deen and be a role model to your students now when it comes to the syllabus <coughs> what should Muslims focus on in an Islamic syllabus I feel there are six things that every Islamic syllabus needs to have number one it needs to promote the correct and authentic Aqidah of Islam every school every madrasa every institute that is teaching Islam to youngsters and teenagers and children needs to promote the correct understanding the correct Aqidah of Islam and in order to do this we need to have the correct Aqidah ourselves so books need to be developed according to the level of the students obviously if you are teaching grade 1 and grade 2 you cannot teach them Aqidah Tahawiyah you need to get hold of books that are on their level and if such books do not exist somebody needs to take up the initiative to write such books Aqidah for grade 1 student Aqidah for 10 year olds write according to their levels such books need to come into come into play we need to have them in our institutes books of Aqidah according to the age group and level and understanding of the students so number one our priority should be Aqidah secondly we need to focus a lot on akhlaq and adab on the character and manners of the students this should be taught in various ways number one by the teachers themselves being good Muslims and showing good akhlaq at all times number two having a structured syllabus about it with practical modern day examples and number three to take the students out into public places and to show them the impact of good character that when you are interacting with people with good character how it brings people closer to you give them a practical reason to have good character it shouldn't just be that you need to have akhlaq for the sake of having akhlaq or you need to have akhlaq because Islam says so no akhlaq and adab attracts people's hearts towards you when you have good character people want to be like you people want to know you people want to be in your company this needs to be taught to the students so they're not doing it ritually they're not studying it ritually but they know this is something which will benefit them in both worlds and so now they will absorb the information better the third thing that needs to be taken into a consideration when teaching students in schools is that they need to be taught the correct approach to fiqh meaning the type of fiqh that students are taught in school should not be one of rigidity and blind following that this is the opinion of our mazhab there's no way any other opinion can be right you have to follow this or this is the opinion of the teacher and you have to follow what the teacher says 
Rather, students need to over time be taught how to deal with fake issues. They need to be taught that there are differences of opinion. This is the opinion that we are teaching and we follow. But you need to be able to respect and tolerate people who have other opinions. Too often the schools, they focus on their opinions in such a way that the students now become harsh and at times even violent to those who have a different understanding. And as I have mentioned in a separate lecture, this is not the correct approach to fiqh. Students need to be taught tolerance, they need to be taught mercy, they need to be taught how to deal with fiqh issues, they need to be taught why. When it comes to fiqh, it's not just enough to teach them the rituals and the halals and harams. Students need to be taught why. To give it a practical implementation in their life. Why do we pray? Why do we fast? Why should we have good akhlaq? Why are there laws? All of this is found in the books of Islam. It might not be available in the textbooks used in school. If it is, alhamdulillah, if it is not there, somebody again needs to take up the initiative to write such books. But this needs to be taught to the students. Fake from the perspective of why. Number four, students of Islamic schools need to be taught education of this world as well. There are many Islamic institutes who believe that this worldly knowledge is a waste of time. They believe that studying mathematics and science and algebra and business economics is not beneficial. And so they try to focus on their students only learning Islamic knowledge. The problem with this is that your child is now unable to fend for himself in the world. He is unable to contribute to society. And he is unable to take the ummah to the next level. Because the ummah as a whole is in need of righteous doctors and engineers and media men and IT specialists and every field you can think of. We are in need of people in each of these fields who are righteous and have the correct aqidah. We need them. If we want to revive the ummah, if we want to reach a level where the ummah is now independent and we have people in every field, this can't be done if we are stopping children from studying the dunya knowledge. They need to be taught the knowledge of this world, but from an Islamic perspective. They need to be taught English, but in an Islamized manner. They need to be taught business economics, but in an Islamized manner. How? For example, in business economics, the issue of interest comes in. The issue of mortgages comes in. The issues of ins insurance comes in. And in each of these things, the children need to be taught the Islamic perspective as well. So this knowledge should not be ignored, but it should be taught in an Islamic manner. So what we produce are a generation of Muslims who are specialists in every field, whatever field they choose to get into, but they are righteous, practicing Muslims, and they are now shaping that field and moving it into a halal manner. It is only because we lack Muslims who are righteous and involved in business economics to a large extent that the Ummah has fallen into a state where we have to rely on banks that deal with interest. But Alhamdulillah, in previous generations, we now find Muslims who have studied these issues. They have studied finance, they have studied business, they have studied banking, and they have studied Islam, they have studied the correct Aqidah and, and uh, approach to fiqh, and now we have Islamic banking systems, Islamic uh, investments, Islamic insurance all coming about because we have had people study these fields. If you stop children from studying these fields, what would happen? The Ummah will not progress at all. So just as it is important to teach them fiqh and aqidah and akhlaq, it is equally important to teach them the worldly knowledge and we can help them to progress as an ummah. The fourth area where the studies of Islamic education need to focus on is the Qur'an. And here there are various aspects of the Qur'an. The students need to be taught tajweed, proper pronunciation of the letters of the Qur'an, and the various tajweed laws. It doesn't mean every student should become a qari. It doesn't mean every student should be taught the various uh, different recitations. But the basic tajweed, so that they do not make mistakes in their salah, this should be taught to every student. With tajweed, they should be taught Arabic. Arabic is a must. For any institute that calls themselves an Islamic school or an Islamic madrasa, a lot of emphasis must be placed on Arabic. 
to revise the language of the Sunnah, the language of the Quran, this needs to be done. What will happen once your students have gained a good level and a good understanding of Arabic? Then, now they will be able to understand the Quran better. Which takes me to the third level, that the Quran in school should not just be taught for tajweed and memorization, both of these are important, but also from the perspective of understanding. Whenever surahs are taught to the students in school, they need to learn the proper tajweed, they need to learn and memorize the surah, but with that they need to understand what does the surah mean, how does it impact my life, and what lessons can I take from it. All of this is equally important. So the Quran needs to be taught from all these angles. When it comes to Arabic, unfortunately, I have seen many Muslim schools that don't teach Arabic. And I have seen Muslim schools that teach Arabic, but in such a manner that it's taught in a very by-the-way kind of manner. That we're just teaching it for the sake of teaching Arabic. And the amount of Arabic they teach the students in 10 years in the school, literally, those of us who have studied Islam uh, in Darul or universities, we have studied the same amount of Arabic in one year. So, the syllabus is not effective. It's not done to the best of the student's potential. We need to develop or get hold of those syllabus which are more in keeping with the potential of the students so that by the time they finish school they should have a firm grasp on the language or at least a decent grasp on the language. And many a times we find that by the time the students finish school they, they literally only know about 20 or 30 words in Arabic. And this, if they've been taught Arabic for 10 years in school, this is wrong. This means there's something wrong with our methodology. So Arabic teachers need to find the most effective methodology and syllabus for teaching Arabic so that they can get the most out of this class. It should not just be taught for the sake of teaching it, but like once again, higher purpose, higher goals must be there. And finally, we focused on Aqidah, Akhlaq, Fiqh, Quran and worldly knowledge. The other area that must be focused on is Hadith. Students need to be taught Hadith. They need to be taught, number one, the importance of Hadith. And in order to stop them from being misled by the modernists and the other groups like the Quran, Yun, we need to teach them why Hadith is important, how it was preserved, and the various arguments raised by these groups need to be answered. So that students of Islamic schools and institutes understand very well that Hadith is one of our primary sources of Islamic law. It is a source of revelation and it is something which we cannot ignore. This needs to be taught to the students. They need to be taught Hadith from a perspective of understanding those Hadiths that are important to them. And memorizing the Hadith in Arabic as well. So perhaps Hadith books like Imam Nawawi's 40 Hadith, these type of books should be taught to the students. They should memorize the hadiths, understand them, and be told to practice them in their lives. So these are six fields that need to be focused on in any Islamic institute aimed at children or teenagers or young Muslims. Obviously, this is not the only things we should focus on. There should be there are other areas of Islam. Uh, but I feel that if we do this much, if we at least focus on these six things, we will, at least, we will then produce well-rounded Muslim youth who will be able to lead the next generation forward as practicing Muslims. There are various resources that are available. For parents, you will find that, alhamdulillah, in recent times, many forms of Islamic media have been produced for children. So you can get hold of, for example, One Islam Productions have produced the Zaki cartoons. Uh, Baba Ali has produced some videos for children. Peace TV has some TV, television programs for children. Uh, there are many resources out there. If you go out and search, you will find many of these resources which are entertaining but educating at the same time. And you will find for your youngest children, these can be the primary sources of learning Islam. Likewise, there are many Islamic books for children sold in the bookshops. Parents should get hold of them at night instead of reading them story books like Literary Riding Hood and Cinderella. We should read for them stories from the Quran, stories from the Hadith. They have, there are many books published showing these stories in a way that is simple for students, to, for children to understand and to benefit from. So get hold of these children's books and teach them to your children. For teachers in schools, there are many different syllabus being produced. We have, for example, in English to teach the students English. 
There is the Iman reading series by Dr. Bilal Phillips. We have, when it comes to Islamic studies, Darul Salaam Publications has published an Islamic studies syllabus by Malvi Abdul Aziz. And IIPH has published a high school syllabus uh, on Islamic studies by Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. So these are being developed. These are good starting points and you'll find that they might deal with certain grades or with certain of the issues that I have discussed, but not everything. There's still room for expansion, there's still room for more. We still need to develop Islamic syllabus for schools when it comes to business, economics and social studies and these various issues. We still need to develop these resources when it comes to other grades that might not be covered in these syllabus. So there is room for expansion. You can get hold of these resources, but we should try and develop according to our place and time resources that are, you know, more suitable. Sometimes, for example, one syllabus might be produced for Saudi Arabia, while different things need to be taught in USA or in the UK in certain issues. So, you know, accordingly, the syllabuses should be modified. So this is something that should be an ongoing thing amongst teachers. We should amongst students and teachers that we continue to develop our syllabus, revise them and improve upon them over time. Uh, we should not just become stagnant and feel that we have Islamic studies in our school, we have Arabic in our school, that's enough. Let the teachers teach it and let's carry on with life. No, these syllabus should be continu continuously revived, continuously reassessed and built upon and improved. This will keep this feel alive and again the teachers and parents need to realize the importance of the role they play in the lives of the children. We need to be role models, we need to be educated ourselves and we need to be able to lead the next generation forward. So with that I would like to conclude and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes <coughs> each and every one of us rightly guided and a means of guidance for others and he makes our generation and the next generation a source of revival for the Ummah. Through education we can revive the nation and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to add this to our scale of good deeds on the last day. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.